Hello, everybody. Welcome to another day of PowerShelling and summiting. Uh, first of all, the session is AIML with H2O and Windows PowerShell. Hopefully, you're in the right room. Um, as far as who I am, why am I up on the stage? Why am I talking about this? Um, number one, I work at I work in New York City. Uh, I work for a Fortune 100 downtown. Um, over there, I spend time working on distributed computing and, and um, sort of cloud computing platforms and those types of systems. Uh, that's kind of where I spend my, most of my time. Uh, I do not work as a data scientist, nor do I work as a machine learning expert. Uh, I simply am a hobbyist, so I've taken some Coursera courses from the Stanford uh, Coursera course. Uh, I've implemented a bunch of these algorithms kind of by hand from scratch just for academic reasons. Um, and what I found is that th this stuff is actually accessible now, right? So what we're going to be talking about today is stuff that you can embed into your applications, build data models, uh, work out predictions, uh, clustering type algorithms to, to you know, help in whatever way you think that it might fit the, your, the applications that you're developing. Um, within my company, I enjoy looking at the infrastructure side of this. So I like spending time with data scientists to understand their problems so that we can understand how to build the cloud computing systems underneath it to be able to figure out how to distribute these problems more easily, how to help them get their, their processing to happen faster, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but again, that's not my day job. Uh, the third thing is that I do spend a lot of time with some PowerShell. Uh, some of you may know me for, through the years, so I think eight times MVP award recipient. Uh, I founded the New York City PowerShell user group. I also founded, there's a text extravaganza talk that we do in New York City every now and then uh, which has an entire PowerShell track to it. And I spend a huge amount of time uh, working with bringing things that are happening outside of the Microsoft ecosystem in the PowerShell community and bring them into it. So helping people see that there's these frameworks that exist out there um, that people are leveraging all the time. So today we're gonna be talking about H2O. Tomorrow I'm doing a talk on uh, Apache Zookeeper and writing clustered applications with that. Okay, so that's why I'm standing here right now. So if you're gonna drill me on a lot of the data science questions, I, I probably will flounder a bit, but I'm gonna do the best I can to at least give you uh, some, some starting points. And uh, it's, it's sort of a soup to nuts. So you don't have to have any experience with machine learning, you don't have to have any experience with H2O. PowerShell will definitely help, because <laughs> uh, we're gonna be looking at basically in, invoking a lot of REST methods through this and uh, understanding the web commandlets, which I think there's an hour and 45 minute talk happening right now on exactly how to use them. Uh, <laughs> that's actually the stuff that I'm, I'm leveraging in this to, to be able to, um, uh, access this, this platform. So what is the platform? Why are we even talking about this? What is H2O? Most importantly, it's an open source platform. Okay, so H2O is a company. There is an enterprise version. They build on top of the open source and you know, add all this color and make you know, things super easy for data scientists in the future. That's where they're headed. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what's open source, what you can leverage today, what you can embed in your applications in your PowerShell uh, code. The next thing that I really like about it is that it's API driven, okay? So there's a couple of SDKs out there. There's Python and R that come out of the box and all the books that you're gonna read have those two languages in them. Um, there is no PowerShell one. So what I, what I would recommend is that I, you know, all the prototype code that I'm gonna be showing today actually could be converted into a module very, very easily. Uh, and it's something, you know, if anybody's willing to take that on as a project, I'm happy to handle that code and it's all MIT licensed. So you know, you can feel free to play with it and do something with it if you wanna get into that. A uh, fantastic project for, for you know, academic reasons if you even just want to understand how to build a module and uh, out of something that's uh, REST driven. Okay, the next thing is that because it's API driven, that makes it cross-platform. Um, and what, what that means is it's not just cross-platform, but it's, it's, it's actually you could have multiple languages using the H2O framework at the same time. So I can have Java uh, application set up a data model, and then I could have the PowerShell connect to that instance and leverage that data model. Or I could do it vice versa. There's, there's, it's completely inter, interdependent. Um, H2O is, is a Java application on its own that spins up, it's a server, so it will maintain the state while it's living, and when it goes away, you know, we lose the state of everything that was there unless you serialized some of that stuff out. But the point is that it's cross-platform, uh, so it will work from multiple languages. The next thing that's kind of interesting is that there's a GUI for doing all of this. And what I'm gonna be showing you today is a series of demos, and we're gonna start in the GUI because the way the REST API works is it's translatable one-to-one -one based off of the GUI. So if in the GUI I train a data model using these parameters, when I go to PowerShell later, um, I will use those same parameters and I will uh, go through the entire workflow the same way. 
Um, the GUI is actually pretty nice for, for just getting and prototyping things pretty quickly, so you can learn how to do something and then s turn that into a script that, that you can then repeat over and over. Another thing that's kind of nice about it is that it's self-contained, uh, meaning that it's not dependent on a cloud vendor. So one thing, the, the API-driven idea is not new. There's plenty of people doing this, right? Azure ML is starting to get into that space. Uh, AWS SageMaker kind of works this way to a degree. Um, and there's this proliferation of libraries that are sort of coming out here. But the, the point is that the API-driven thing isn't new, but what it means is that I don't need to have a cloud vendor for it. I can run this on-prem, I can run it in a cloud, I can do whatever I want um, with this open source bit. Uh, the next thing that's super interesting is sparkling water. Uh, gotta love that library name. Uh, so that sparkling water is a combination of H2O and Spark. Uh, so if you don't know Spark, Spark is a distributed computing platform uh, that provides you, so you can have clusters of these Spark instances. And what Sparkling uh, Water actually does is any algorithm that you would pick and start to train a data model on, if it could be done in a distributed fashion, it will leverage your Spark clusters to do so. So if you happen to have Spark clusters, this is fantastic. Or if you can spin up Spark clusters on demand for this type of processing, it's really neat. Uh, I toyed with actually doing all my demos with Sparkling Water, but I only really have my laptop, so we're going to do a single instance H2O for, for all of this stuff. So. Uh, but it's pretty, pretty simple to spin it up. Okay, uh, the next thing that I, I really like about this is that there is a flow, because the company H2O is in the business of making this super easy to productionize, um, the, the data models that are built on it, they, uh, they had another open source project called Steam, which is now deprecated, but it's, it still exists, and uh, you can basically fork it, you can compile, and there's one particular bit of service that's open source there that will convert the data models in H2O into REST services, and it's really cool. So this is a way to basically export out of H2O, get a WAR file that you could then run as a web service somewhere that you could then invoke via PowerShell, right? Um, so you don't necessarily even need H2O after you've trained up your data. And uh, I don't know if this is the final one, but grid search and auto ML. The other thing that's really nice about this, this platform is that it provides you, so, when you start working with these algorithms, and you're gonna see in a second, when I show you like the first algorithm and we look at all the parameter options that are there, it's blinding. Like there are so many parameters and they all do things and we don't know what half of them actually do, right? Data scientists may. Uh, some of them, what they, when you talk to them, they're like, oh no, we, I like to play with these parameters or I like to try these things. Um, but there's no hard and fast rules of like this will always work and this will always work. So the answer to that is um, what's called grid searching or there's, there's another technique called Bayesian optimization which is actually even better than that which H2O doesn't have out of the box um, uh, but there is a, a third party library for that. But the idea is that I can test a whole bunch of different parameters against my data, like uh, my algorithms, try a whole bunch of them and see which ones turned out the best and evaluate which model I want to use now. And so um, that, that functionality actually makes this really easy. And the auto ML one is the super easiest of them all. It just takes a little while to run. That's a no-brainer auto ML. Here's my test data. Find me the best thing possible. And a couple hours later, it'll come back with, with a bunch of data models that you can look at and evaluate. At which point, you could then say, all right, this algorithm seemed to work best for this data set. It seems to be pretty consistent. You know what, in the future, I'm not gonna run all of them. I'll just do grid searches on just that one algorithm now. Okay, so it sort of, sort of simplifies things for you, and it's very easy. So this demo, this, this entire thing that I'm doing right here, uh, like we're gonna train up some data models, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some of the open data sets that exist. Uh, almost all of it could be done in like five minutes <laughs> of all the demos that, that I'm doing today. Uh, but I'm gonna take a lot of time, we're gonna go through each of the arguments, we're gonna talk about what is actually happening under the covers and, and kind of get a little bit deeper with it. Okay, so as far as what we're gonna be covering, so uh, we have, uh, we're gonna start with H2O. I'll show you how we, we download it, we spin it up, how we access it. Uh, we'll talk about the user interface. So H2O via flow, and we'll train up the, our first data model in that. Uh, at that point, we'll also look at REST hacking. So I'll show you how you translate from the, the web UI into PowerShell. Uh, we'll then do, we'll generate some data models. We'll, we'll create it for, uh, like I said, a pair of open source, I'm sorry, open data sets. Uh, iris data, which is predicting the flower type based off of the dimensions of the flower, as well as the MNIST data, which is handwriting recognition for uh, digits, numbers. And so we'll, we'll look at both of those. 
Uh, we'll also look at not really mathematics. I'm not going to go into the mathematics of this, but what I, what I have found is that at least understanding from a visual perspective some idea of what, this math, what, what the math is actually doing is very helpful in understanding what you're actually doing. So again, it's, there's gonna be no numbers, there's gonna be no symbols <laughs> during the mathematics part, but you will see some charts and graphs and I'll explain what's, what's actually happening as we, we go through this. Uh, also do a demo on unstructured learning. So this is the idea of finding clusters and groups of common uh, patterns within your data sets. So the, the, the greatest example of this is like the Netflix um, recommendation engines, where how do I bucket, let's, let's say I wanna bucket the world into, let's say I think there's 50 different types of people in this world. I wanna find out which movies they've been liking together or figuring out, and so we find like little groups that we think that they'll, they'll like, and then we can you know, maybe recommend those, those additional movies to them. Um, we'll do a demo on the grid search, so the parameter tuning. Uh, I'll talk about, I'll show you a demo of productionizing these data models and turning them into REST services that you can access from PowerShell uh, much more easily. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do a demo of auto ML and just look at the additional resource. Big day, big day. Uh, everybody get ready, hands up. Now, uh, that, that's the end of the slides though. I promise the rest of it is, is pretty much all in code until we get to some of the math stuff. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to start H2O. Uh, so H2O, you download from their website, so h2o.ai. Uh, there's a latest stable release, which you can get, and uh, the instructions to install are pretty simple. Unzip, run java-jar to the jar file that they have. Okay, that's, that's kind of hard to see, but three easy steps. Um, and what it looks like over here is simply, so I, I have a folder already where I've downloaded a whole bunch of files, so let me just show you what's in here, so this way you can see. Uh, I don't know how well that's visible, but um, in this directory, I'm gonna highlight the things that didn't come with H2O. So really, it's just anything that's unhighlighted is all that came with it. The H2O jar file is 86 megs, so it's not even that, that bad. Um, and then what happens is it looks like this. So java-jar, and we will run this H2O. Oh, obviously you have to have Java installed. Don't ask me about versions of Java or anything like that. I really know nothing about Java, so <laughs> I just know how to execute and compile. Okay, um, this actually usually takes only a second, so hopefully I'm not getting the jcool curse, but <laughs> looks like we're all right. Okay, so it spins up H2O and then it gives you this, uh, this H2O flow browser. Don't ask me about securing this at the moment. There are plenty of documents that you could find online about all of that stuff. Uh, I'm just simply gonna be pretending that there is massive security and that I'm the only one who can access this. Okay, so this is what the interface looks like, and let me uh, make this a little bit bigger so you can see stuff. Okay, um, the interface, if, if you have played with like Jupyter Notebook or Zeppelin Notebooks or any of the, 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 the notebooks that exist, uh, web notebooks, it's kind of a similar in, in its idea. These are actually what's, what's called cells. Um, so in each of these cells, I can clear this, and what, what actually is happening is if, if I, I can run, rerun any command that I've run, so I can come back up to here, I can hit shift enter and it'll run that again. Uh, I can also run that assist command just by hitting this button and it'll keep, every time I do something, it's basically gonna just add something to the bottom. It's, call, it's called a flow because you're showing kind of the, the flow of how you're doing this uh, you know, data manipulation, the modeling and processing and all of that stuff. Um, before we also get into anything real, I also wanna show on the right hand side the help actually has a decent amount of stuff, which looks like it's a little scrubbed here. Um, there's examples, and I'll, I'll be showing uh, one, we'll actually be going through the cluster, k-means clustering later in this, through the, one of the examples. Um, and then there's also the H2O REST API documentation, which is actually embedded in here, which is super helpful when, when you're, when you're um, uh, using this with PowerShell. Okay, so uh, this is the interface. So the first thing that we wanna do is we actually wanna import some data into here. Actually, I'm gonna take this really hot in here. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna import some data. So let's, let's actually talk about the data that we're, we're looking at here. Um, it's called the IRIS data. It's actually a very small data set, um, which is really interesting when you think about it because we're talking about 120, 150 rows, I think it is, 120, 150, whoa, too far. Yeah, so 150 rows. Um, so it's not a huge data set. And uh, all that's in this data set, so you've got, uh, this is a CSV file, so you've got uh, the sepal length and sepal width, width which is um, you know, a dimension of the flower. Uh, you have the petals length and the petals width, and then a definition of what that actually is. So in this case, you can see that this is an iris setosa, and if you come down here, you'll see that there's three categories of flowers. There's iris setosa, iris versicolor, and there is iris virginica. 
And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be saying, we're basically going to be trying to train using this data set to say, okay, with these inputs, these four columns here, um, we know that this is going to be this class. So build me a model where if I give you those dimensions in the future, you can predict what class of flower that actually is and tell me with what confidence you, you think it is. So that's what we're, we're actually doing. So let me pull this data into H2O. So the way we do this is we import files. So um, I will take one second just to show that, uh, so the, the sort of web hacking here, control shift I on Chrome, you know, you, you use your inspect. Um, the network bit right here is actually the, the one that you want to watch uh, when, you're, when you're looking at this stuff. But here I will, so you can see it's doing a whole bunch of lookups right now, which I, I really actually don't really care about. What I care about is the next thing that happens. So after I add this, so let me clear, and I import, um, you can see over here on the right, I can see the, the path, so the, the URL that was used. I can come in and I can look at the actual post data that was sent to it, as well as look at the response data um, pretty easily. And what you'll find is that when working with H2O specifically, there are some things that the, the JavaScript, the web GUI does and implies, and so you're not sure that, you're not, you don't realize that it's actually like a two-step process instead of, it looks like a one-step process. Um, in, and so it, probably the biggest example of this is the next one, which is parse this file. So we've imported it, and now we have to parse it because it's a CSV file. When I hit parse over here, it does this uh, setup parse function, which actually is the function that was called here. Okay, um, the parse setup is actually kind of interesting in that it, it makes some predictions about what types of data you have here. So it finds that these are numeric, it's giving me an enum for the class because there's only three of them, so it's, it's, a, it's a better way than, than string. Um, so it's done all of this for me, and, but the problem is that once I have this, what I actually am doing when I click parse is I'm taking all of the outputs that were here in that above thing, so anything that was returned from that parse setup, I actually have to pass into the parse files function, right? And so I'll show you the helper code in PowerShell when we get to that in a second that'll, that'll, that'll make this uh, a little bit more easy and make you understand what I'm talking about here. Uh, but for now, just know that there is a lot of things that you may have to take from one function, get the return value, uh, manipulate in PowerShell, and then send it off to the, the REST interface for the next one. Okay. So we now have this iris header data in here. And when we have data in H2O, and actually let me close this so it's not so cluttered. So when you have data in H2O, the first thing that happens is you get some statistics on it. So we can see a little bit about the data. I can see that, okay, look, the, 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 the min here is 4.379 uh, max and the, the averages, et cetera. Um, I can also see in the enum that there's 50 that are labeled zero, which is actually expected. Uh, so generally, the, like missing or zero you may be concerned about. It's more about data quality and just making sure you have a good data set. Um, however, in this particular case, an enum is 0, 1, 2, because it's ordinal. So therefore, there are 50 of one class. So that's why that, that shows up as 50 zeros. Um, this does raise a very, very good point, though. PowerShell is one of the best languages ever for data manipulation. So, you know, because of the fact that you have your filtering, you have your conditionals, your where clauses, um, all of those things that are built into the pipeline, data manipulation actually is better to do in PowerShell than in something like H2O. Uh, I'll also say, having done this in Pandas on Python and, uh, you know, using some of those data frame type technologies, that PowerShell just blows it out of the park as far as use, usability and making things simple to do data manipulation. Um, so what I would suggest is, is you wind up writing, doing anything that you have to fix the data, you do in PowerShell, send that out to CSVs and then import it into H2O. Uh, it just makes your life easier, so this way there's less of uh, having to figure out like what, what actually, what settings and what data types and things like that to use. Okay, so I have data in here. The next thing I wanna do before I do anything is I'm gonna split this data into two sets. I'm gonna basically say, I want 90% of this to be one set and we're gonna call that our train data, and then 10% of it is gonna be my test data. And this is a pretty common pattern to split up data sets like this, uh, do it randomly uh, when you're training your data models. This way, you can use the data from your train, that 90%, I can build my model from that, and then I can validate the model against the test data to see exactly how well it did. Uh, we're gonna talk a, a lot of, uh, later about overfitting, which is this idea that you've made it so that every bit of test data works, or train data works perfectly but nothing on test data ever works because it's so like hyper fit to um, just the one particular set of data. That's something that you absolutely have to avoid. Anyway, in this point right here, I've got my train data and I have my test data. The next thing I would do in H2O, so I'm gonna call my assist again so I can get my, my things back, is I'm actually gonna build a data model out of uh, this, this train data. Actually, I could do it from here too. 
Oh, I'm sorry, the one other thing I wanted to show you guys was that there's also the ability to view the data. So you, if you wanted to actually see what was in there without having to load into Excel, let's see what it looked like, um, you can get a sampling from, uh, from the system. Once I have that, so I have my trained data right here, I can now build a model. Okay, this is where the fun happens. Uh, you have to choose an algorithm. <laughs> what do we choose? Anyone want to pick one? Bayes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the honest truth is it's very confusing to figure out what, especially when you have no understanding of what any of these are doing. Uh, what I can say is that there is a uh, algorithms page on H2O right here that has a list of, uh, it's got a list of like the, co the common sort of parameters that are used by all of these things. And then they, they have them bucketed into three. So there's supervised, unsupervised, and miscellaneous, which is really uh, NLP, that's uh, natural language processing, which is basically taking uh, documents and tokenizing them in a way where they could then be used by machine learning. I'm not gonna be talking about that today. We're only gonna be looking at the supervised and unsupervised. Supervised basically means that there is a category in the data set. There's something that we know it, what it actually is. So in the iris data, we knew that each flower, uh, what cl class of flower it was. In unsupervised, unsupervised is again, it's like that Netflix recommendation in that you wanna find groupings, but you don't know any, you don't really know the, what, what it's gonna be. And so what you wanna do is find a, make an algorithm in a way where, or make a model in a way where if I send it some data set, it would tell me which group it would belong to. That's, that's kind of the goal with those. So those are the two. Now, as far as choosing one, well, they're all, sort, they're all kind of crazy and different. Um, there's a lot of parameters. So this is, this is the documentation just for one algorithm. Um, and if you look here, there is a lot of stuff that can go in here. Um, I don't know what half of this stuff does, to be honest. And I'll be completely frank. Uh, it, it is a matter of, of you know, tweaking, figuring. You can read up on these things. Um, as you're playing with it, try a different parameter an, another time. You know, uh, expand your understanding of each of them as you go, um, a, as you look for, for better data models. Um, but for the purpose of our experiment here today, I'm going to show you the simplest way of doing these. And I'm going to actually just choose the um, gradient boosted machine. Um, although, to be honest, they're, they're all the same. The, the interesting thing is that, which you'll, what we're, we're gonna show is that the interfaces that I'm doing right now, the very basic, so a training frame, I know it's gonna be this train data. The validation frame is the test data I created. Um, Enfolds is probably the most interesting one to think about in that it, it's, it's a, there's techniques of cross-validation so that it's, it's kind of like without having to have the train and test data separately, it does some interesting randomizations to try to prevent overfitting on its own, but uh, I'm actually gonna just leave that alone for now. And finally, I have to tell it which column is the column that we're, we're is the, the thing that we're predicting, right? Um, I don't have to ignore that column because it knows that that's the one I'm predicting, so it's not gonna include it in the inputs. But uh, So at a very basic level, that's all the, the information I need to get, submit to it. Um, like I said, there's a whole bunch of other things, and we'll talk about grid searching and how you can tweak these later, but uh, let me just show you how we build a model very quickly. Uh, so that's done. Oh, no, now it's done. That data model it now exists. So I can look at that data model, and I can see some statistics on that data model. So first I can actually see how it was built, all the parameters that were used. I can see uh, log loss in this case is what's used here. Another one that you'll see me pull up is this thing called MSE, which is like the mean square error, which is uh, trying, to, in all of these cases, it's a matter of trying to get the number as close to zero as possible, because that basically means that it's um, fitting really nicely. Um, here you can see that what it's using in its data model. This is actually really interesting. Uh, pedal length, pedal width, it feels that there is, you know, it needs to know that information to make the prediction. The sepal length and sepal width is actually not as important to the classification of this flower, which is, you know, it's just a fascinating fact, right, that you may not have gleaned from this data by looking at it, but now as you look at the way these models are interpreting it, you see how it's used. Uh, underneath there, you can see how it was performing. Actually, this one is performing pretty poorly, to be honest. Even in the training data, it's getting about four wrong here, three wrong there. Uh, the, the validation data, it's actually done pretty, pretty well, where it's only getting two wrong out of the, the full set. Um, but anyway, the point is, like I said, eventually we're gonna be tweaking this and trying to get these better and better. But for now, we have a data model and we can do predictions. Like, the, the, the work is done. Now the question is, how do we use it? Um, and using it is actually just as simple as importing some new data that we wanna uh, validate and then predicting off of that. So let me do that right now. I have um, a file that I created in PowerShell, which I'll show you the code in a, in a little bit. It's just one row. It has this input, so 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, and 0 0.15, and it's gonna tell me what uh, flower that is. So 
Uh, the way I do that is I can basically say first import that data. So we're going to go through all the rigmarole that we did before, which is fantastic when you have PowerShell because you can just do it quickly. Uh, so what was it called? Predict. Okay, so we import the data, parse the files, uh, we're going to parse it, or parse set up the files, parse the files, and then the job runs. Um, also, another thing to note is these jobs, anytime the job screen comes up, that's an asynchronous call. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in code in a little bit how I turn asynchronous calls into synchronous calls, because there's basically a, a callback lookup URL where you can see the status of the jobs. There's a whole job subsystem built into H2O for this purpose. Okay, so I've, I've imported the data, and now I'm going to go back to my data model. So I get my model and I am going to predict using this model. I'm going to say, okay, use that predict data the set that I came in and predict. And so now I can look at that result and I can see that there is one row, four columns, which was expected. And what ha ha comes back is it's saying that it's an iris atosa. And then I've got three numbers here. This took me a long time to figure out what the heck was going on here, especially in code, because this got really confusing. But this is percentage of confidence. Uh, so in this case, it's saying with 100% confidence based off of this data model, this is iris atosa. It is impossible for it to be Versicolor or Virginica. Um, and you'll see in other data models when you run it, it actually has different percentages and of, of what it thinks that its confidence is. Okay, that's it. We did um, the bulk of the hard work, right? Like now you can actually leverage this thing and use it. So what's next? The next thing is how do we do this in PowerShell? Uh, let me just make sure. Okay, how do we do this in PowerShell? So for this, I'm gonna basically do the same exact thing. We're gonna use a different algorithm. This time I'm gonna do a neural net because neural net's the hotness, right? That's like the real machine learning, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain why it's that way in, in a bit. But I wanna start from scratch. So I'm going to actually restart my H2O. Uh, and when I do that, like I said, it it's, it's, uh, doesn't serialize the state down. So in a second, this will come back and we'll see that it's blank. So we're starting with something from scratch. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so if I do get frames now, I should see nothing. And if I do get model, I should see nothing. So this is a blank H2O with nothing in it right now. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is let's build up my PowerShell environment. Uh, what the heck is that? Windows Inc. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. All right, uh, layered here, and I'm gonna create, so apologies, I know you guys aren't used to VI, but I am. So I am going to, up at the top, put, put the code in the scripts that we're, I'm gonna be looking at, so my doit.ps1, uh, and then down at the bottom is where I'll be pasting and executing and that kind of stuff. Okay, so there's two functions I have to talk about before we get into actually using the, the uh, REST API. Uh, the first function is this convert to form data. This is the bit that I was describing before. I'm going to take the return value from that, let's say, that parse setup function and pass it to the parse function. All this function is doing is it's taking an object and it's looking at its properties and it's basically saying, okay, if it's Boolean, well, then the property chain that's going to be posted into the form data says uh, basically give me that property equals true and then I'm adding the ampersand. Uh, and then I go through and I do the same thing for arrays. So collections are basically formatted in the proper, with the proper uh, um, syntax. And then finally, um, anything else is just key value pairs, right? So we just value, uh, output plus equals property and the ampersand at the end. And then at the very end of this function, I remove the last ampersand, right? So this way I now have a complete uh, post sort of URL of that data that I can throw into the, the function that I'm gonna call to the REST API. Is that clear? We got sound good, all right. The next one is how I turn the uh, asynchronous calls into synchronous calls, or at least give you a, a hook to be able to figure out how to pull it and look at it. So the way I do it here is I use a wait H2O job, which takes a path. So which, what I'll show you in a bit when we look at the return values is that it provides you a URL, and that URL, or it's not really a URL, it's the path part of the, the API URL. Um, and then we'll add that to the REST API, so this way you have the uh, callback. And then I query that right here. It's every half second. Actually, I'm going to change that to two seconds. I think it makes my machine crash less when we uh, do some of the really deeper neural net stuff in a bit. 
Okay, the, the next thing I have is the URL. So this is the base of the API. I'm just constantly using localhost. I could have parameterized this. There's so much I could have done. This is prototype code, please. This is not production grade code. This is just proving the idea. Okay, uh, if you're not familiar with this syntax, hopefully everybody is, because this is pretty much the, the way I do all of my string manipulation, is to use the old VB, v basic um, uh, templating within your strings. So if you're not familiar with this, this bracket zero, uh, basically when you do dash F in a variable there, anywhere that first variable is, is gonna go into all the dollar sign zeros, and then uh, these are all gonna go into the dollar sign, uh, I'm sorry, into the bracket zeros, and these are gonna go into the bracket ones. Um, and that's just a way to quickly sort of uh, template and then add content to the strings without you know, ensuring that there's fidelity. The next thing is I have uh, my iris URL. So this iris data, uh, I did manipulate. Oh, good, good, good call, good call. You could have let me burn for a while. That could have been fun. <laughs> All right, so uh, iris URL. Uh, so. The, the original demo, the, so I have the code sample that I'm showing right now is on my blog. So powertoe.wordpress.com is the last blog post. Um, it used this from the, from the internet, so it, it grabs it in real time and pulls it down. But just because I was worried about demo gods and all of that, I downloaded it locally, which actually required some of the, the later calls to be changed a bit. This parse setup body actually had to be changed a little bit, but it's like a syntax thing. Uh, basically. Uh, H2O, uh, it's, it's, it all has to do with like the destination frames that it interprets and the names. So I'll spare you the details on that. It just, you know, it's, it's a little bit of nonsense. Um, anyway, we should be abstracting those into better functions, which I, which I do a little bit later. Okay, the next thing I have here is the first, the first function that was called, right? So in the, the flow that we did earlier, we did the import files function. And so here you can see me calling that import files function. Um, all I'm doing is changing the body. I'm setting the path equal to the iris URL, which is this local one. And then I'm invoking the rest method, and I get a return value. Okay, that return value is, um, you know, kind of holds most of the data and stuff. And actually, I'm going to run this right now. Actually, I'll run it up to here. So then the, the second command after this is parse setup. So parse setup is that one that ran, and I needed that return data back. So that's why I kind of want to pause there so you can see the output. So uh, let me just comment the rest of this out, and we'll run this. So... Chuckling at my uh, my environment. <laughs> uh, I was looking at your decision to comment the out as opposed to like. <laughs> yeah, no, this is just easier. This is Vim style. All right. Anyway, so I have the stuff here, and what I really want to show is this return value. Um, if you look in here, there's there's all that data um, that that actually gets pulled back. And then if you look, what I'm, what I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to take that output from the other one, uh, and actually I'll show it to this way. Okay, so I'm gonna take the output and I'm selecting these parameters from it. I'm then gonna pipe that into that convert to format to form data, uh, which is then gonna convert that into the post that I'm now gonna submit back to the, the REST API. Everyone follow? is the actual PowerShell stuff. You guys should know this. <laughs> All right. So let me comment back this out. And um, here I'm going to actually invoke it. And you can also see, and I'll, I'll do it up to here. So what I'm next going to do is I'm going to call the, the parse function. And I'm going to invoke the rest method. I'm going to get the return value. And what I want to show you before I run it is this return job key URL. This is the, the path that I was mentioning gets returned back in the asynchronous calls. So if I look at that, it's just a path here, and that's the job subsystem. So this is the job that's running in the background. And then now if I run my wait H2O on that, uh, it is actually already done. I mean, this, this took a couple seconds, but just for the sake of completeness, it says it's done. And you can see that it basically has been applying uh, the same pattern, so and then it just uh, uh, adds that to the REST API call. Okay. Next thing we're gonna do is call the REST API for splitting the frames. Um, so again, the rest of this is all pretty straightforward. I'm really just doing everything that was done in flow. And the way that I found out what parameters to su supply here was by doing the, the inspecting the network messages and seeing what's actually getting passed when I was trying to do something that I wanted to do, looked at what it was supposed to look like and then applied it within the code here. Um, if anybody wants to do the open source stuff on this, uh, it's really a matter of understanding, taking each of these API calls and turning them into functions, to be honest. It's, it's 
pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, so we're gonna split the data, and then finally we're gonna train the data using the, this time we're gonna use a, uh, a deep learning model. So you can see this, so that's the, the, uh, you know, the more black box type stuff. And we'll pull that data back, and then finally um, we're gonna predict. So the next thing, so this prediction is, is the exact same thing we did before. Uh, the difference here, oh, it's so actually, we were gonna predict off of the, uh, oh geez, let's just do it from here. So this is gonna predict basically off of the train data to tell me, uh, sorry, the test data to tell me how well that model is performing. So I'm actually gonna just run this whole thing again. Uh, probably get a couple of errors because I've already imported some of this data. Oh, actually, you know what, for completeness, let's just restart it. Okay, so it's up. Uh, and then this time I'm gonna run it basically up to this point so that we can train the data model. That's not it. Wait. Okay, loading the data, parsing the data, and it is splitting the data. It is training the deep uh, model and it's done. Okay, and then if I look, it's validated. So that just did a neural net for me in, what was that, a couple seconds? The neural nets actually do take longer with larger data sets and the MNIST data that we're gonna look at in a little bit, which is like you know, 20 megs or something, um, is gonna take 10 minutes. But uh, you know, it's, it's actually not that bad. And here you can see that the MSE, so it's about 3.12. This is actually a really bad data model. Um, this one I would never, I, mean, I would actually, you'd need to tweak it because it's not that accurate. Uh, I only know that because I've done this data set so many times and seen the results of what good data models look like, so I can tell you that that's actually not that good. Um, finally, the last thing that we're gonna do is uh, do that prediction. So you can imagine now, it, this is one way that you can, you can load these data models into H2O. We can also serialize these and reload them in, but the idea is that they are living in H2O now. So if this data model exists there and I want to ask it for a prediction, it's as simple as this code. It's uh, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating my CSV file, right, uh, for the thing that I want to test. I create it as an ASCII file right here, so predict.csv. I then call all the same functions before, the import, parse, setup, and parse. Finally, I do the prediction. And I use that same data model and I predict off of it. And then at the end, we get a result back. So with all of that said, let's actually run the whole thing now. And we should see, so I will wipe it out completely. Okay, so we've wiped, it is up, and we will run do it. So we should get, let's see if the MSE gets a little bit better. Splitting the data, training the deep le uh, learning model. Ooh, oh, that's because the file already exists and it was open, sorry. The, uh, the data was serializing down to predict. And here you can see that it predicted with 99% that it is irisitosa. And remember I said that it took me a while to figure out these numbers, uh, is the probabilities. It was especially just, I just kept looking at the E minus 05 and not realizing how small of a number that was. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's there. And that, that actually, what, what I'll show you a little bit later is when we export these data models, um, these, this is how it re always returns the, the values to you. It shows you with, with um, what probability it thinks it, it uh, is one of those things. Okay, it's pretty cool stuff, right? Yeah, feeling good? All right. The next thing uh, I want to do is I actually want to look at a more complex data set. And then I'm going to basically going to run the exact same thing, but we're going to do it with the MNIST data. And so I, love, I love actually showing what this looks like. Uh, so the first thing that we do with any of these projects is actually look at the data. So here I have MNIST, and then I actually have some code in here called import and render. So import and render is basically, you know, let me just start it. So import and render up here, uh, the function that's, that's running right now, is basically gonna import the CSV file. Um, it creates a, a headers, because there's no headers in this, in this data set. So uh, let me explain what's in the data set first. It's a columns, the first column says a number. So it's a number from zero to nine. Okay, that's the number that the pixels are. The next, column, the, the next set of columns are individual pixels. So it goes from like upper left all the way across, and then it, you know, kind of repeats, and it tells you the shading value of each one. And so what I did was I wrote a very quick parser that will uh, visualize what that looks like. So here, I've taken the whole data set, I'm just getting one sample out of it, so the sample looks like this. Uh, actually, no, the sample does not look like that. The sample looks like that, nope. Oh, I didn't dot source it. 
we got to do it again. Okay, dot source, let's let that run. Anyway, the point is, um, I'm, so here you can see that I basically am getting one sample just to, to see what the first value looks like. I'm splitting it so that I can look at the value as well as that pixel array. So I've got those two uh, variables right now, value and pixel array. Value is, again, the value, which I think is the, the number seven. And then the pixel array is going to be that, that list. And so here you can see it rendering what it looks like to render the number seven in ASCII. Uh, what it actually looks like in the real world, those, there's way better visualization out there for this, uh, but these are what they kind of look like. They're hand-drawn numbers, okay? And the goal here is that when you look at this data, right, this is not something that we can interpret. Well, maybe some people can, but. Uh, so for example, here's the pixel array that, that's the number seven, right? Obviously, right? <laughs> So uh, just gradient shading on, on each of the pixels. And then that, we know that that equals the number seven. And so what, instead what we're gonna do is we're going to train the same way that we did in the, the iris data, but it's a much larger set of columns with, um, with not that much commonality. Like we don't really understand this data set that much. And so we're gonna apply a neural net to it because the neural net's gonna kind of figure out that, that for us. It's gonna do some black box and, and kind of put it all together for us. Um, and the goal with this is again to build a data model where if I supply a new pixel array, so a new image, it will tell me what number it thinks that is, right? That's the goal with what we're doing here. So for this, I'm going to run this, like I said, it takes about 10 minutes to run, so I wanted to, uh, and actually, let me just make sure we clear, I just wanna clean up H2O so it doesn't have cluttered stuff. Oh, actually, I actually meant to show you, the data model we just had is actually in flow right now, but I just killed it so I can't show it to you, but I'll, I'll do it on the next time when we do the deep learning one. Okay, uh, there it goes. So now we'll run the MNIST. Oh, and let me show you what that code does. So this is the, the form, this is the, the code that we're gonna run. It has the two functions, the convert to form data and the weight H2O job. There's also one additional function I wrote in this one, which is import H2O data. So those three steps, which were really tedious to look at, and you know, like you know, ten lines of code each time, um, I created it into a little bit more of a, a function. So you can say import H2O data, give the path to where it exists, give it a name that you want to call it in the data frame. Um, I, I've been using that word data frame. I don't know if I explained it, but data frame is really just a data set. Everyone gets that? Okay. Um, so we give it a name, we, we pass it the API URL, and if we want, we can sp supply a list of columns if we know it uh, doesn't have a, a column, a header in it. Uh, it then runs those three sets for us, so this way we don't have to look at all this code anymore. Now it's simplified down to this. So we run the headers and we import the two data sets. So the way this MNIST data works is they give you two data sets. They give you a train data and a test data. Um, these are open uh, data, uh, uh, data sets. You can download these, you can, there, there's open source licenses for most of them. Uh, Kaggle is actually an interesting place to look for like some of these data sets and challenges and things that, that exist out there. Um, but you can download this stuff and play with it yourself. And so here I'm gonna import this data, I'm gonna call one test, one train, and then I do the whole thing again just with the, the neural net. And that's, that's all that's gonna do. So let's run that. And then we're gonna take a little bit of a all right, so that's gonna take a few minutes. Um, everybody stand up, stretch. I'm not kidding, let's get up. Uh, another thing is this is, uh, this is Mrs. Whiskers. Um, Mrs. Whiskers was sent by my daughter. Uh, she insisted that I had to take Mrs. Whiskers with me. So what I'd like to do is actually get a little picture with all of you guys and Mrs. Whiskers. Maybe we could raise your hands up, I think that would look nice. <laughs> uh, yes, Mrs. Whiskers. Actually, wait, even better. How about everybody on the count of three say, Mrs. Whiskers says hello from Washington. One, two, three. Mrs. Mrs. Whiskers says hello from Washington. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Appreciate that. All right, now that the blood's moving a little bit, uh, let's talk about some mathematics. Woo! All right. Uh, as I promised, I'm not really going to be doing too much on the math side, but um, let's pull that up. OK. Public domain vi uh, image. I love these things. I can actually put them in the presentation. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the problem. Right now, I'm training a neural net against a massive data set on my laptop. So uh, looking at these images might be a little slow as we go through this. Okay, so the first one I'm gonna show you here is, and you know, this, I, I should mention also that we've been calling this talk artificial intelligence machine learning. Um, Technically, some of that only applies to like the deep learning type stuff. A lot of this stuff is just analytics. This is just mathematics that we've been doing for a long time. Um, what I like about these visualizations, though, is they kind of explain what we're actually trying to do. So in this example here, um, imagine that the stuff on the left, that column on the left, is actually our value. That's the thing we're trying to predict. The thing on the bottom is the input, right? So there's a number, and we think that, we know that what we want to say is, okay, at 0.5, where do we think that dot will be for the 0.5? And so what you wind up doing is you build these functions. So in this case, this is a linear function. All it's doing is it's trying to find the, the easiest way through this. This gets really complicated though, and it's actually fun to kind of go through the mathematics on these because you'll find stuff like, imagine if you had an outlier, right? So if there was a data point, let's say up here, ooh, I think I just killed my zoom. Okay, so let's say there's a data point up here. Imagine what that would do to the line. Like the whole line would shift up towards it, and then you'd have completely skewed results. So there's actually mathematics in figuring out where those are, those outliers, reducing that, you know, ensuring, and there's all sorts of things that, 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 that apply to this. But at the end of the day, all that's happening is we're creating a function. We're saying, give me the input and tell me where it's gonna sit on that line. Okay, that's, that's what a data model actually is in, in this context. Another thing that can be done with this type of data model is, so this is a line. Um, and we could say that on one side of the line, everybody has cancer, and on the other side, nobody has cancer. Uh, it, it, but but it's, it's genuine, right? Like that's, that's actually how you, 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 you know, these functions can be applied to categorization as just as much. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of other things. So the line is actually really easy to understand. It gets a little more complicated if you add more variables, basically because how the heck do you put that on a two-dimensional chart, right? So I gotta, that's not possible. So what I can show you is there's a, uh, an article here, uh, and actually I already have them open, so I'm just gonna pull it up. And that's gonna take a second. And that's gonna take a second. Fortunately, there's only 10 minutes for that thing to run, so. Any day now. Okay, there we go. So this is a visualization of, of um, of basically uh, you know, what it would look like to map out multiple dimensions. So down at the bottom, you can see two dimensions, and then your value is at the top. So at the end of the day, again, these are just mathematical functions, right? These are, well, they're not always mathematical functions, but in this case, we're, we're looking at them as mathematical functions, okay? So you're finding lines that fit so that when you put the inputs into that function, where it gets graphed is the point at which it's the prediction. Okay, very easy to kind of understand it from that perspective. Um, this came from, doo, 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 doo. it's a research paper uh, from okstate.edu. I'm just trying to, all right, that's gonna take too long there. Apologies, but I do have to give the credit. Any day now. Okay, ordination, okstate.edu, sorry, that took so long. Uh, the next one that I'm gonna talk about is overfitting. So now that we're drawing these lines, it's actually easy to see what, uh, what we were talking about earlier with overfitting. So this is an example, all right, we'll call this the categorization one, right? The blue ones are, they have cancer, the red ones don't have cancer, okay? There's a bunch of data that goes in and it applies, and what you're seeing here is two lines. You have a black line and a green line. The black line is a decent function, right? that actually gets the majority of them, and yes, there are outliers, right? So some blue dots in the middle of the red ones that don't seem to make sense, but you know what? Um, it's, it's fairly accurate to, to just incorrectly do them, uh, you know, predict on those. Now the problem is, of course, knowing the data set and how it's gonna be used directly affects your confidence level. So if this really was cancer, we probably would not want, we'd be very, very sensitive about false positives and false, false negatives. However, if it's something like, you know, you're looking for anomalies within your logging data, within PowerShell, like it's a much different story, you're okay looking at some false positives and false negatives. Um, the overfitting idea is what if you actually, and some of the, these algorithms actually do this, they write functions that are so tight that they fit completely around the data set like this. So that, now the, the best example of this is uh, in this bottom, uh, sort of portion right here. 
So imagine in that green bubble there, imagine the blue that's between the black line and in that green bucket, right? That would likely be a blue dot, right? Chances are, just by us looking at this, we can all probably agree that if it was directly even next to that red dot, it would probably be a blue dot. Um, this model, when it runs against this, this data set, will be perfect, 100% perfect. But then when I start adding those, those variable things that are, you know, would show up a different way, it's going to basically overfit it. So it's something to be mindful of as you look at these things. And that's why it's really important that you split your data into train and validations, that you can test it, and you, can, and you constantly want to you know, randomize those types of things and look at them more deeply uh, and, and kind of evaluate what, whether or not you are overfitting, because it's a real problem. Okay. The next one I want to talk about is, so we've been talking a lot about the mathematical functions and the models. Um, there's another type. Uh, there's uh, what's called decision trees. So decision trees are actually pretty uh, simple. So this is a GNU image from Wikipedia that I have to give credit to. Ay, ay, ay. When is this job going to finish? Uh, <laughs> so uh, Riz, Riz Karafik, um, which I, I actually have to. And GNU, uh, I'm sorry, just have to call the license. Oh, sorry, this one is not GNU. This one is the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License. Okay. So with this image, I have um, an example of multiple decision trees. What is a decision tree? Very simply, I can think of it this way. Imagine that I started a question. I'm going to interview you. I'm going to decide what to do based off of these questions. First of all, how much money do you have? Zero to $500 in my pocket. Uh, we don't want to talk to you. I have a grand in my pocket. We want to talk to you. So that's a first decision, right? I'm making a decision there. Once we find out you have a grand in your pocket, we want to find out how many assets you have. Like, what do you own? <laughs> what can I take from you also? And so we may find out, you know, which buckets you, you know, yes, no, I meet these thresholds. And so if you're a, a, a big whale, I want to go after you. I want to, like, sell you some investments or something. The, um, so a decision tree is actually very simple to put together, and we do them all the time. They're just simple yes, no logic flows. Um, the challenge is in tuning those. Why did I choose $50? What if I chose $49? Would it work better? Like, what would it actually look like? And so there's a whole branch of this, this mathematics that fo focuses on that. And the big one is this uh, distributed random forest. So this is basically an idea of how do you combine multiple decision trees and put them together. So it basically kind of like, you can think of it as like averaging them together. And it kind of, you know, comes up with some sort of thing completely between all of them and, you know, comes up with some confidence. And it constantly tries all sorts of different patterns of distributed, uh, of uh, decision trees to kind of even get, you know, some good feelings about which ones are working and not. So I just want to highlight that some of these are not necessarily like 100% mathematical. Now the next one is the complex one. This is the fun one. So in this one, I'm, I'm going to reference just the image from this uh, ACM magazine for students, XRDS, um, written by this Abdurlaham Hosni, who he, yeah, this is actually a really good article. I have the link in the, in the deck that talks about, um, you know, what the neural nets are actually doing and how it applies. But what I really want to show is this image. So this is a neuron. Okay, um, I think they actually, pull, he pulls this from the Stanford course, Sarah course. But the, the, the neuron, um, the dendrites, uh, everybody knows what a dendrite is, right? <laughs> uh, so the dendrites are where you're, you're basically going to get your um, uh, sensors, uh, have inputs. So you can think, you know, your ear, right, hears something, and it turns into an electrical signal that then gets applied to the dendrite. And then I have a neuron that is dedicated to hearing that processes that in the nucleus. It takes that signal, does something to it, and then puts it on the wire. It puts it on into an axon. The axon is then connected to additional neurons. And so there's a whole chain of signal uh, manipulation that actually happens in our brains. And what the, the deep learning uh, modeling is actually doing is, 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 is mathematically trying to model some of that and figure some of that stuff out. The really fascinating thing about this is that there was a research paper published uh, where they took, I can't remember what animal it was, but they took, um, they took the, the neuron that was used for hearing in an animal and they disconnected it from the ear and they connected it to the eye. And the neuron transformed into a seeing neuron, which is really magic, right? Like th that's the whole point of these things is that they're actually learning. They're learning what the sensor is. They're figuring out how to process the signal in a way in which you'll be able to use that information later. And that's what the neural nets do. Now, the problem with this is that they are completely black, black boxes. 
Um, whereas the other things were easy for us to maybe visualize, show some charts and graphs and things like that, these wind up becoming, um, so this is, the, this is an example of the, the neuron as it's drawn in, in the math, but it's basically, you've got the same thing. It's the inputs, I do my processing and I get something out. And then what happens is we look at them through chains of these. We have, these are called layers. Um, and you'll, you'll hear this term, but basically some of these neural nets may have mo way more than three layers. They may have like lots of hidden layers and you don't know exactly what's happening. They're all communicating with neurons in the way and they're all transmitting the signal and manipulating the data. In, but honestly, this is actually probably one of the most interesting areas to watch from like a PhD perspective because there is a lot of people trying to figure out how can we make sense of the data and the, the, the metrics and stuff that's coming out of these types of algorithms to help us understand them better. Um, but honestly, that's way above my pay grade. All right, so that's the neural net. And fortunately, I think our neural net has actually completed. So let's take a look, and you can see here that it is predicting a whole set of data. And actually, I'm going to pull this up in H2O flow now so that you can see what this did. Right here, five. Okay, so remember, I ran the PowerShell code. Again, this that MNIST data. I was running a deep learning, the neuron type uh, training against it. So now, if I run get models, I actually see the neural uh, model that I had. I can also look at the predictions that were running. So this was the one that was run against my test data. So actually, I want to look at that more closely. And here, I can see, first of all, I can see that you know the MSE was 0.5, which is okay. And... I can inspect this data. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I don't know why I'm having problems with this. That is about it. Hold on, let me just, uh, actually, I'll pull it, let me do it in PowerShell. I, for some reason, I can't find it in Flow right now, but I know it's there somewhere. And I happen to have all of this data here, so I'll just use it here. So uh, the last thing I was doing was looking at return.frames.com. Uh, so this is the output from the last command I ran, which is looking at the predicted data. Um, and you can see here in frames.columns, there's a data... And this, so what this is, and I'll, I'll just look at the top 10. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jeez, that was weird. <laughs> Don't normally do that. Uh, anyway, uh, so here's the results. So, and, and I'm gonna, op I'll just open in Excel. This will just, this way it'll take less time at this point, because normally I would do this in flow, but. All right, so this is the test data that came back. It was basically, what it was doing is it was looking at the pixel arrays. Oh, I had it loaded in memory. So here's the pixel arrays again. Um, so this is the, the, t the, the prediction, the, the stuff that I was just running. And what you can see is, so for the first number, it was in the number seven. And our model predicted 7.29. We average that down to seven. Uh, the next one, 1 1.6, averages to two. So therefore, it predicted that that number two hand-drawn was actually a two. Uh, the 1.0 applies to this 1.0 here. Um, this actually, actually, this one worked out pretty nicely with the test data. So 0, 4.2 comes down. So that's what I did. I just bulk tested this entire test set and seen what the predictions look like. Um, I, I'm just comparing them manually now, even though you know, the MSE actually showed me the mathematical um, bits to that. And now, at this point, you know, I can actually, through PowerShell, submit you know, a pixel and say, what, what number is this? Right? Um, now you can start thinking about the practical applications of this. Uh, you know, think about your logging data. Think about anything that, you know, the, the creativity is really, in, it's in your hands at this point. If you know your data sets and you think that there's an interesting application to it, there probably is an interesting application to it. Okay. So that was the neural net. I've got one more thing I want to show you guys on the math side. And uh, now I'm going to actually demo this one and how we do this uh, in a second. So this one is GNU. And I can now move things again. Uh, GNU free documentation license credited to Chire. Okay, and this is the, the, what this is illustrating right here is it's illustrating a mathematical model that is basically finding the clusters. So this was, again, this is the Netflix idea. How do I take all of these data points that exist and find the commonality? 
And the way these algorithms work is you usually tell it how many things you're looking for. So in this case, we're gonna actually be doing a demo where we will look at um, three, we will basically bucket them into three different categories. And this is just a mathematical representation of what that kind of looks like. Yeah, and obviously, as usual, it gets more complicated with more inputs. You wouldn't be able to visualize it as cleanly, but I think the idea is sound for you to at least understand what we're actually doing. It's, it's basically finding the points at which it wants to break this into three, and it's then calling each of those a group. Um, the illustration itself is actually in the algorithm implementation in that how it's changing the lines over time and manipulating it, but you know, we don't have to go into that. It's just more about a visualizing what's actually happening. So what does this look like in H2O? Uh, I'm gonna do this one in H2O, we're not gonna do this in PowerShell because at this point, the stuff that we're doing in H2O, you can all do in PowerShell through those, those REST methods. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up an example flow here. Oh, also, I don't know if everybody noticed, but I was loading that data in PowerShell and now I can see it in H2O, right? You can see all the data frames, all of that stuff. Okay, so k-means example. Let's load this up. Um, so here's a great example also of how you can take these flows and you can use Markdown, you can apply, like, you know, you can actually hand this to somebody and say, hey, run through this. Like, this is actually how, how we train these data models. Um, in this case, what they do in the examples is they, they give you the instructions, they tell you, okay, run assist me, and then they show you the function to run. So you can either click the button assist me and it brings you all the way back down to the bottom and you follow the, the, the stuff. Um, or the next thing it does is it shows you sort of the functions that you're gonna have to call. So in this case, I, if I called import files, it would give me that, that dialogue again, but they also provide you the parameters. So I can just simply import files here. So here I'm importing another data set. This is uh, seeds.dataset. It's very similar, simple, sim, uh, similar to the iris one. Uh, so we're not gonna go too crazy on that. Oh, actually, I wanted to restart this. Ah. It's all right, okay. So that data's in there. We're then gonna parse the data. So we'll run the set of parse, and then we're gonna parse the files, and I'm just using the functions that the examples provided me. Um, the interesting thing is when we're building this model, so there's a couple things to note here. When I hit build model and I choose the k-means, so this clustering, uh, hold on. Okay, so assist build model, here we go. Um, what I'm selecting here, there's a couple of parameters that we're setting. C7 is basically saying ignore that column. Uh, K, because that's the column that, or actually I think it's C8. I think that's wrong. Uh, that's the column that they're categorizing. K is the, the, this number three is that we're saying that we're gonna do it into three buckets. So we're looking for three groupings of, out of this data. And then there's a couple of other things here. So I'm just gonna run that. We'll see if my change actually breaks anything because I've never tried that. <laughs> Uh, the model exists, I can now predict against it. And the important thing here is to look at what the sort of the output looks like. So um, it's showing me that it's created three centroids, which is our clusters, and how many are in each one. And I can actually look at this data. Uh, this takes me a second, hopefully I'll find it. Uh, yeah, I think it's this. So there's some statistics about the data, and then here's the actual data. So it's basically doing the same thing, it's predicting. The difference here is that, uh, whereas in the past we were training with known quantities of like what the names were, iris vitosa, iris set, uh, uh, versicolor, the MNIST data, or each numbers. In this particular case, we, we don't know what they are. They're just zero, one, and two. And so everything is coming back as zero, one, or two, which basically means that they're grouped together. So now if I run another prediction, so I can basically take that data out, I can run another prediction off of a new set of data, figure out what group it belongs to, and then I can go back and look at that group and then maybe provide it to the end user and say, hey, these are the ones that you kind of associate with. Okay, make sense? All right, we're good on the k-means? Good. All right, let's move on to, we're in the home stretch, 1003. Okay, so I did the unstructured learning. The next thing I wanna show you is the grid search stuff, okay? Grid search, as I mentioned before, is the idea of taking one of these complex uh, algorithms and not knowing all the parameters, but knowing an idea of what we wanna try and then iterating and trying all of them and then comparing the models. So let me restart H2O so we have a clean one. All right. And let me load that again. Okay, 
So um, we're going to do exactly what we did before. I'm just going to quickly import the iris data, just so you can see this as a quick one. CH2O iris. We'll import, we parse the files, oh, parse setup, sorry, then we parse. Okay, so we've imported the iris data again. Uh, I'm gonna split that data into the two. So 0.9, and we'll call that train. 0.10 is called test. We create that again. And now I've got my two fr frames. So now I'm gonna actually try this grid search thing. So the way I do this is I take my, my, my training data here and I say I wanna build a model like we, we normally do. Um, now in this type kind, uh, so I'll do the distributed random forest just for fun because we haven't done one of those. I'm going to basically select my training frame, select my validation, so the same stuff I normally do, and my response column class. And that, now this is when I typically just was hitting run and we were creating the data model. What you see over here on the right though is there's this grid question mark, okay? And if you look, there's checkboxes. So anything that I can do a grid search on has the checkbox. So for example, number of trees. And if you notice, when I click this, watch what happens next to that 50, semicolon, all right, which means that I could probably put more stuff here. So now I can say, all right, I wanna try 50, I wanna try 100, I wanna try 150, I wanna try 200. Max depth, I wanna, uh, let's, let's make that a grid search. We wanna try 20, we wanna try 40. Okay, I think that's good enough for now just as an example of what's gonna happen. Uh, but I could do this with all of these, these parameters here. Um, and as I mentioned, there is, there is this newer technique that people are using. If, if you've never heard of it, Bayesian optimization for parameter tuning is a really, really interesting. There was a, a talk that an MD from Two Sigma gave at QCon two years ago in New York that's online. Highly recommend it. He, he goes into the mathematics of how it works, but um, his prediction is that basically anything that accepts parameters will be using embedding this technology into it over time. Um, and the examples of practical implementation besides this that he gave was tuning uh, your Java parameters as well as tuning your cloud templates. Like to, your, the, the options that you submit to Azure or to AWS, uh, actually is figuring out like what the ideal optimal VM is and like you know configurations and things like that. It's a, it's a really interesting um, space. But anyway, for this one, this is not that. All this is doing is bulk iterating. I gave it a couple of options. It's gonna try this one, this, this combination, try this combination, try this combination. Let's run that. Build. All right, so you can see it's taking a little bit longer than the other one because right now it's building a bunch of different things. It's scoring them. It's trying to figure out which one is the best one. And then we're gonna see what it looks like after it's done. So it's finished. I can look, and now I see that it actually created one, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, I have a few more. So there's eight data models there. Uh, now I have to figure out which one I wanna use. So I can look at a couple of statistics. Uh, there is a scoring history. So I can see what the RMSE was for each one of these. Um, it's basically saying it thinks this one is the best one. So then I could say, all right, well, let me predict that. Let me look at that one against my, my uh, test data directly and see how well it's performing. And here you can see it's actually performing fantastic. So against my test data set, the MSE is at 0. .000. So this is actually a really good, we, this, we finally got a good uh, uh, data model uh, for, for this, this data set. Uh, but anyway, that's the point. I just wanted to show you that that grid search works. Now, again, with PowerShell, that part, what you're gonna have to do with that is figure out all the parameters you wanna try, inspect the network, look at what the, the post data is for those grid searches, and then just apply it into it. Okay, yeah, it had zero error. That's pretty incredible. Okay, that was that one. So the next thing we wanna talk about is productionizing this data, this, these types of things. Yeah, Pojo, good. So um, in each of these data models, and I'm gonna take the one that we just built, and we are going to serialize that out of the system. And the way we do that, so first of all, I'll just say get my mind models. So we'll take this one that was pretty good. Okay, so I can say uh, download Pojo. So Pojo is a plain old Java object. That's what it stands for. Uh, it's basically a Java class that you could either embed in your application or what we're gonna show you is how I can convert this using the Steam interfaces to turn it into a WAR file that you can then turn into a web service that you can then use from PowerShell uh, without needing H2O at all. Uh, so download Pojo. That's gonna grab the Java file and I'll, I'll show you guys what's in there in a bit because uh, using it manually is kind of cool. 
Uh, the other thing that happens is there's this gen model that you need to download from H2O, for which each version has its own. It's basically just its own jar file. Um, I've already downloaded that one. This one I want to actually put, I want to make sure we're doing this one. Uh, so let me copy that there. Oops. So what I'm going to do is I've got a POJO directory, and I'm going to paste this one in. And OK, so the one that we're working with is grid 6.4, 6, uh, 6F4. All right, so that, I just want to remember that. Um, in this folder, again, I've got the H2O gen model, the thing that I just downloaded, and that POJO file. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is, so I mentioned that there's this open source project that's deprecated called Steam. So Steam H2O. Uh, da -da which you can fork and build. Uh, but there's one very specific folder in here. I'm just going to, well, I was going to show it in GitHub. Yeah, OK. So there's one particular folder in here that if you build this prediction service builder, uh, will allow you to pass the POJO and the jar file that we just downloaded and spit out the WAR file. Um, I can get this to work on Windows. I've had it working in the past. Right now, I couldn't get the class paths to work, so I just um, cheated, and I'm doing it on the Ubuntu shell. Uh, but Basically, the service looks like this. So uh, you have to grab it, download it, and then run Gradle commands to build it. Uh, once it's built, there's a war file in here. You can see the root.war. And now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run uh, java-jar and run one of these jetty runners. I honestly don't know the differences. So I'm just going to run the one that looks like the most recent. And then I'm going to pass it that uh, root war file. And so when I run this, ooh, that's new. Well, fortunately, I did process this a few times. <laughs> what was that? Maybe there's a reason it's <laughs> yeah, right. It's true. Now, the reason it's deprecated is actually because they're they've turned this one in, they're turning this one into more of a commercial product. They left the open source one, but most of the magic that they're doing now is is in the paid version. Okay, there we go. It was just the version of Jetty Runner I was using. Uh, okay, so it spins this up on port 8080. So now if I come here to port 8080, I should see a nice little service. Oh, no. Oh, I see the problem. I do see the problem. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the wrong war file. Something is... Let me just try one more thing. I could always, uh... anybody know any good jokes? Building, up to date, building, running. Okay, and it's running at localhost 55,000. Let's see if that works. No, it's this, oh, there we go. Okay, good. Oh, okay, Whew. that's the right one. So we select this POJO. Uh, here I'm going to pass in the POJO file that we created, which was 64F. I'm going to select that jar file that I downloaded, the H2O gen model jar, and we're going to build this. When I build this, it's, what it's actually going to do is it's going to create a war file for me. It takes a few seconds on this one. There it goes, so it's downloading the war. Once that opens, I'll... Grab it. I have no idea why 8 megs is taking that long. OK, so we've got the file. Let me open it. So I'm going to take that war file. I'm going to copy it into my POJO directory. Oops. And I'm going to basically call another Jetty Runner service on this war file directly uh, it, within, within uh, Windows. So H C drive, H2O. OK, we made it. So I've got this grid 64F uh, dot war file. So I'm going to come here to, we're going to create another shell. And in this one, I'm basically going to call from the Steam directory, which is where I downloaded the Steam and built it here on this one, the prediction service builder. So it's Java-jar. Jetty Runner, which I will do that one, 
And then the paths to the WAR file, which was C, H2O, POJO, uh, shoot, what was it, grid, 64F, no, WAR, okay. Uh, also, let me make sure I kill the other service that was running that was doing the conversion, just in case we clobber any ports or something like that. Okay, so now I'm gonna run this service. All right, it's running. Port 8080 by default, so now let's check out what, what that actually looks like. This is really cool. Uh, hold on. Not this, I don't know what that is. <laughs> All right, local host 8080. I now have a web interface. I can say, all right, what's my supple length? I think it was a really big one, it's 30. Uh, my supple width was uh, 15, <laughs> and the pedals will go 0.1 and 0.03 or something like weird. Uh, anyway, now this service, I can say predict. So this is not running in H2O anymore. This is running, this is a, just a web service that, that I pulled out, and it's a WAR file. And here you can see, it comes back with my data. It says Satosa 0.879 probability, there is a very small chance, less than 1% that it's Iris Virginica though. Um, the other nice thing is now I can actually you know, craft these URLs. So this is a, a complete REST service. So I can take this and we can invoke REST method in PowerShell. And say invoke REST method. And so what you can think of is, the, the reason I show this demo is I, you know, I like to think of the pipelines you need to productionize these things. Like you can take that Jetty runner conversion thing, put it as your build, part of your build process build it into the service and then you know, run tests against that. But anyway, here's the invoke rest method on this. Uh, oh, we're gonna need quotes because there are some ambersands and all sorts of nonsense in there. Okay, so here you can see it comes back with the exact same data. So now I've you know, accessed it within PowerShell. I can access it from anywhere. It would be kind of interesting if we can figure out like Pojo to PowerShell or Pojo to .NET. I think there's some projects that people were working on, but it's way too complicated. Uh, what I will show you is what the Pojo looks like because the other way that you can do this is you could just compile quickly a Java application that uses this Java class and uh, uses the function in there, which I will now show you. This took me a long time to figure out, so I'm very proud of this. Um, because this is what the POJOs look like. Oh, let me just make this bigger. There are enormous amounts of code with lots of nonsense and crazy amounts of functions and all sorts of weird words and who knows what's going on. It's dividing all sorts of things. This is the magic, this is the mathematical model. Like this is, well, this is actually, I mean this is an algorithmic model I suppose. Uh, but anyway, the point is that there is a score zero function. Uh, and actually it looks like I went to, let me go up to the top. Score zero function. This is the, all you have to call. So if you were to load this class, build a Java application, and you leverage this, this it takes a, a reference to a, a data structure, so it's to a, to a list of, um, of the inputs. And then what it does is it provides you, you, you provided a reference to uh, an array for the outputs. And so when you run the prediction, it's going to load the, that into that collection there. And it shows it to you. This is the, the place where it was really weird. It shows you in that point nine 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 nine. And the other thing that's kind of strange about it is it doesn't tell you what type it picked. It actually forces you to know that the first one, like the order at which they're listed, uh, which I can't even remember where you see them, is, is the order that they, they come back in. So it, the, the, score do, like the, the score function doesn't actually give you that information, it just gives you those three numbers and you have to, to interpret them. Cool stuff? All right, let's see what we have left. I think I flew through this. This, is, uh, this took me a lot longer. Oh, auto ML, last one. Yeah, we really burned through this. I swear this took me an hour and 45 last night. <laughs> All right. Uh, so AutoML, we are going to look at one more of these. So for this one, I do want to create a clean one again uh, because this is basically going to generate a, a ton of models. Oops, just run it. And as I mentioned, this is the, the interface, like if you don't know what algorithm to use, you're not sure what to even try, try the AutoML, see what it comes back with. Uh, it'll take some time. This, even against the iris data, this will take you like a good hour or so. Um, there are some parameters to help it exit early and you could always kill it and look at the models generated like you don't have to have it run, which is what we're gonna do right now. Uh, but there's a separate function called run auto ML. Oh, let me load the data, apologies. Import files, do this all again. H2O, iris. Okay. 
Okay, import parse setup parse. Okay, now we can do an auto ML. I'm just gonna do it, I'm not gonna split them this time, I'm just gonna, just to, to make this a little bit faster. So run auto ML. Auto ML takes a training frame. Um, it's the same things as, as the other ones did. Which one is the response column? Do you have validation uh, for data frame? In this case, I don't because I didn't split them. Uh, which actually may kind of show weirdness when, I, when I'm looking at it, but that, that's all right. We'll just run this now. Um, there's some additional things that you can say, okay, so for early stopping, I want this to only run this amount of time. Like you can set some parameters here to make sure that it doesn't you know, get out unwieldy and out of control. And then I just hit build model. Now it is trying a series of algorithms. It is trying them in parallel. And if I happen to have Spark behind the scenes and was doing sparkling water at this point, it would be distributing this across all of my clusters. Everything out there would be training up models and testing them and validating and deciding which one is actually the best one. Uh, again, because I didn't do the validation, it's not really going to be fair. Um, but I will say also that this is happening in parallel. So right now I can see the models as they're getting gener generated. These are all of the models it's trying, which is kind of cool. And then I can look at any of these individually and I can compare them, I can see how, how they look, um, all out of the box. I mean, there's more you can do with this stuff. If, if you get really into this, like you can spend a lot of time figuring out how to, like, like what's, what's kind of interesting is as you lose the mathematics for visualizing uh, how the data model actually works, you can actually apply mathematics to the various models that exist and how they're, they're, they're out there to kind of visualize like which ones are working the best and not and things like that, uh, which is kind of fun. But there's a whole, this is where data scientists spend their time, tuning these things, making sure they have it right, figuring out uh, the, the next things that kind of come into this world are, are weirder things, like what happens when I introduce new data sets that completely blow away my old model and don't make any sense anymore and they, they're not valid. Also, how do I productionize these things regularly? Like, you know, if I'm putting them through a CI-CD system, like, how do I test this? And if I make a change to one of these models, like that has some serious impact depending on like what that code is actually doing. For most of the PowerShell stuff, probably, hopefully not. But uh, if any of you guys get really super creative with this and you know do some interesting practical things, you may want to think about those things. Okay, uh, so that's going to keep running, and actually, I'll just kill it for now, so that we can take a look. Oh, here it is. So we'll cancel that, it's up to the GBM. It's gonna actually try pretty much all of the, the models that were out there. Um, anyway, I can now look at this and it tells me here's the best ones. These ones were like super fit. Uh, unfortunately, because I didn't have the, the validation set, like we can't tell which ones these actually are working because uh, these are all just super fit to the actual uh, training data at the moment. Um, you can also look at some, there's a lot of log information. Um, and then each of the models themselves, you can see the parameters that were set so if I say it like right here, I can say model parameters, and I can see what was used when this was created. So now I can go and find the ones that I liked, and you know, in the future, I'm not gonna run this whole auto ML thing, I'm just gonna run these ones in a grid search and see which one comes back the best. It was a lot of information. We sucked up a lot of time. Uh, the last thing I wanna do is just leave you guys with the resources. Um, there's a few out there that I think are worth the time just looking at. Um, first and foremost is the h2o.ai portal, that's their documentation. Uh, there's the H2O algorithm documentation, which I showed you the link to there. That's basically all the parameters and what you can set there. Uh, my blog post with the code samples, and I'll be posting this to that blog. Uh, I th it looks like we're all posting our own stuff to, to it, it looks like there's no central place, so I will post it to my blog. And, uh, but right now you can, you can grab the, a lot of the, the, you can get the Iris Virtosa, Virtosa deep learning um, scripts right from here. And I think there, there is a MIT license on these. I can't remember where I stored them. I think they're in Git. So feel free to use and, and in any way you see fit there. Um, and it kind of walks through a lot of the stuff that I was talking about today as far as you know, how the REST API works, how we build the models, how you use them, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't go kind of deeply into a lot of the stuff I talked about, but just the, the reference example to get yourself started. Um, I also highly, highly, highly recommend the Stanford Coursera course if you really want to have, uh, if you want to understand it a little bit better. That Coursera course will have you implementing the algorithms from scratch in some cases. Uh, um, it's a lot of matrix math. Uh, it, the, what I will say is if you do go into that course, the teacher, Andrew Ng, who was the guy who invented the, the cat categorization algorithms against YouTube to find cats. He was like looking for cat videos. Anyway, he, um, he tells you very clearly 
do all the homework, but when you get to the neural net one, don't feel obligated to do the homework. I spent two and a half months working out the mathematics and trying to get the implementation right to get it all to work. I did get it to work. I'm looking back at it during this course, like as I was preparing for this, I have no idea what I did. So <laughs> I will recommend what he says to skip that part of it. He, there's great stuff in that neural net one, like he has a bunch of good videos and things that describe it and talk about how the math actually works. But um, yeah, I would, I would highly recommend not actually doing that portion of it if, if you, unless you, you know, you're masochist like I am, so Sado. Anyway, uh, H2 <laughs> Coursera course. Uh, oops, this is a new one I found. So apparently H2O put out a Coursera course. I haven't tried it yet, but uh, you know, since it exists, we might as well use it. And then there's an O'Reilly book, The Practical Machine Learning with H2O. Uh, all the code samples there are usually in Python and R. Um, another thing that's kind of strange when you look at code samples in Python and R and something to keep in mind is that they don't map to the H2O flow model because there are SDKs and libraries They've um, gone and you know, basically abstracted all of that stuff. So you only see one import file function instead of the three that we've been doing over and over today. Okay. And with that, Twitter handle Tonoff. I can actually have time for questions. I don't know if I have answers for any of the questions, but all right. I guess I'll give back the 15. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.